Shalom, I'm Sari Ochevit Brigler, and welcome to my home in the old city of Jerusalem. Today I'd like to share with you a story and a lesson. I think all, uh, all stories should end with lessons because we're in this world to learn our lessons, right? This is the great school where we learn our lessons. So this story took place just a couple days ago on the holiday of Shavuot. Shavuot is the holiday of the giving of the Torah. And in many Jewish communities like ours, people stay up all night long learning Torah. And here in the old city of Jerusalem, we have the opportunity, the privilege to, uh, from the, from the, wherever we're learning here, right here in the old city, which is next to the Kotel, the remaining part of our, uh, of our temp, the, uh, the, outside wall of the retaining wall of the, te of the Temple Mount from uh, built by Herod for the second temple 2000 years ago. So that is our second holiest place in Judaism. Our first, first holiest place is the Temple Mount itself. Um, the, so we all go down there, like tens of thousands of Jews pour in from all over Jerusalem and, and go for the sunrise praying at the Kotel after a night of learning Torah. So I was engaged to, uh, I was asked to be part of an all night learning for women at the, uh, at the community center here in the Jewish quarter. So um, when my turn came to speak, I was speaking about the, the, you know, the giving of the Torah really is the giving of the 10 commandments at the revelation at Sinai the God, the infinite God of the universe manifests, like came down, I don't know how this is even possible to happen. It happened once in history and, and gave the 10 commandments. And I spoke about the first of the 10 commandments, which is I'm the Lord your God. And there are two names for God that are used in Hebrew. One means refers to all loving and one refers to all powerful, who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage means that I intervene in history and in your personal life for your benefit. So that was my theme. And of course that brings up the subject of what about the things that are not, that don't feel like they're for our benefit. We, we understand that everything is from God, either directly from God or indirectly through a human agent, but some things do not feel like they're for our benefit. And so I talked about that. And one of the ideas that I present on that score. I, it's a whole different lecture. I'm not gonna go into it today. Um, one of the ideas is that there's such a thing as tikkun, where you're presented with a difficult, challenging situation so that you can do tikkun, which means rectification. So you can do rectification of something from your past that you did wrong in the past. It could be from this lifetime or a previous lifetime, something you did wrong and you have to fix, or something you failed to do and you have to do proactively. So, so I decided to illustrate it with a story that I had never told publicly before. I had written it once, but I've never had never told the story, but somehow that night, middle of the night, uh, Shavuos night, there were about 80 women in this uh, large room. And um, most of whom I didn't know. I, pe people come in from all over Jerusalem and many uh, visitors, from America and other places. So mo most of the women are not women from our, from our community. So, so um, I decided to tell the story. And I prefaced the story with a little exp explanation that I am, um, I've always felt myself to be a reincarnated soul from the Holocaust. This is of course my book. I've been here before when Souls of the Holocaust Return that I spent eight years researching have stories from 550 other people who have dreams and panic attacks and flashbacks and phobias that are indicative of a Holocaust incarnation. So having felt, felt like since, since I was a young child and I do not come from a family with any Holocaust survivors or any direct connection to the Holocaust, I come from a family of second generation American Jews. So um, I always, since I was a child, I explained, had this like seething hatred for everything German, as it would be natural if you had 
lived and died in the Holocaust. And I wouldn't buy a German product. And of course, I wouldn't go to Germany. And I was telling this, so, so that's the background of the story. I was asked about 12 years ago, now I'm going to tell you the story as I told it to these uh, women that night. About 12 years ago, I got a call from the secretary of the chief rabbi of South Africa, Rabbi uh, Warren Goldstein's secretary, who asked me to come and speak at the first Sinai in Daba, which was a big conference where they have speakers from all over the world. And, um, and I said, fine, I agreed to go. And they were going to buy my ticket. I said, you can book me on any airline except Lufthansa. I don't fly Lufthansa. And they booked me on Lufthansa. It wasn't their fault, I explained, because I had a speaking engagement back in Israel at a certain date. And there in South Africa, I was speaking not only in Johannesburg, but also in Durban and Cape Town. So it was like there was no way I could speak all the engagements that were part of the Sinai and Daba in South Africa and be back in Israel uh, for my speaking engagement in Israel if I had flown El Al, for example. And, and, uh, and Lufthansa was the only one that could get me back in time. Okay, so I'm flying Lufthansa. When I was standing in line at Ben Gurion Airport here in Israel, uh, standing in line to check in for this, this uh, flight that was going to take me to Frankfurt, and then was going to take from Frankfurt, I was changing planes to, um, to Johannesburg. I had a five and a half hour layover in Frankfurt. Not what I wanted, but what I had to do. And while I was standing in line at the Tel Aviv airport, an older Hasidic man came up to me with this girl in tow. And he said that this is his granddaughter. He asked me if I was flying to Frankfurt. I said, yes, he could obviously identify me as a religious Jewish woman. And he said that, that his granddaughter came with her mother to uh, Israel for a wedding, and the mother is staying for the week, but the granddaughter has to, has to go back for an exam she's having in school. She's 16 years old, she's never traveled by herself, and uh, would I take responsibility to make sure she gets on from the flight to Frankfurt that she gets her connection to Antwerp? It's a two hour, she has a two hour layover in, uh, in Frankfurt. So I just said, well, of course, you know, no problem. Little did I know, no problem. You know, uh, I have five and a half hours easily. I'll, I'll put her on the plane, put her on the plane to, to Antwerp. She'll be fine. I took responsibility. So then we're on the plane. She's sitting pretty far away from me, but I'm giving my, I know where she is. And uh, we sit on the runway for over an hour. And as I said, then the German pilot says, and you know, it's the middle of the night, so I have to like be very animated in my presentation of this story. And so in my best German accent, I say, you know, the pilot said, uh, it is always this way in Tel Aviv. They always find something that's wrong with our papers. And so there's nothing I can do about the delay. And I said, and this was a tip not surprisingly anti-Semitic statement, like, you know, like it's always the Jews who, who mess us up. So, okay, we left an hour and a half late and I was already starting to worry. And they announced about two hours into the flight, they announced that there were some connections that would not be made, that they wouldn't get there into Frankfurt in time for certain connections, but we'll know more further into the flight when we know whether they were able to make up some time. Sometimes you can make up time when you leave late. About an hour before we were supposed to land, they started announcing the list of flights that will not, you will not get there in time to make these flights, but don't worry, you'll be put up by Lufthansa in a, in a, in a hotel in Frankfurt. I'm thinking, Gitty is not going to stay by herself in a hotel in Frankfurt overnight. This cannot happen. And one of the flights that they listed was the flight to Antwerp. So I got up and I asked to speak to the head stewardess. And I said to her, I was like filled with fire because like this cannot happen. This Hasidic girl cannot be left on her own in a hotel in Frankfurt. And I said to the the stewardess. And it wasn't even a matter that she was actually, that the plane was going to take off before we landed. But Frankfurt's a big airport and you have to get from one gate to another and, you know, they close the jetway, whatever, 20 minutes or 30 minutes before they actually take off. That, she was, you know, 
this was going to be a misplay. And I said to the stewardess, there's a 16 year old Hasidic girl here and she cannot spend the night by herself in a hotel in Frankfurt. And the, and you have to hold the, the that other flight for her. And the stewardess says, oh, I understand. I, I also have a 16 year old daughter. And I said, no, you do not understand. This girl is Hasidic. She has never seen a movie. She has never seen a television show. And she has never gone anywhere unchaperoned. You have to hold the, flight, the plane for her. She cannot stay overnight in Frankfurt by herself. And you have to do it. And I was just, I was filled with fire and really came on strong. And the uh, stewardess, blonde haired, blue eyed stewardess said, oh, oh, okay, I'll see what I can do. And I sat down again, like just for, no, first I got the person who was sitting right by the exit to change plane, to change seats with Gitty. So she'd be right by the exit. And uh, so she's for best chance. And, and the stories told me she would see what she could do. She, she saw that, you know, I was fire. And um, sure enough, when we landed, Gitty was the first one out of the plane and the stewardess had arranged for uh, like one of those electric golf carts to take Gitty, was waiting for Gitty at the exit of the jetway to take Gitty to her, to her gate for the Antwerp flight. And my son and I were still waiting. It was a big plane, hundreds of people, and we were still waiting to get off the plane when the stewardess came up to me and said, Gitty is on the flight. Baruch Hashem. And I had a sense when I thought about it afterwards. This is the story I'm telling on Shavuos night. I had a sense when I thought about it afterwards that this was a tikkun. That in my previous life in the Holocaust, I had been responsible for some person, some younger, some younger person, and I was not willing to stand up to a German authority wearing a uniform. I mean, <laughs> this stewardess was only wearing a stewardess uniform, but the idea of a person, a German person of authority wearing a uniform, that I was c correcting something, rectifying something I had failed to do in a previous lifetime. So that was my story. I went on to finish my talk, and uh, we spent all night learning, and, uh, and then went down to the hotel. The next day, in the afternoon, there was a knock on my door, and a friend of mine, Jenna, came. came. She asked to come in, sit down, and she told me there were two German women in the audience last night, German non-Jews, and they left after my talk, and outside they were crying and crying. Well, I didn't feel bad that they were crying. You know, like if they're crying because Jews still feel scarred and have antipathy to Germans about the Holocaust, okay, that's something that they have to face. I didn't feel guilty about it at all. Um, Jenna went on to tell me that these two, she called them girls, I know that's not the politically correct term for people, they were in their 20s, and, uh, and they said that they learned about the Holocaust in school, but nobody talks about it outside of school. It is part of the German curriculum. They must, everybody must learn about the Holocaust in school. But nobody, um, nobody learned, talks about it outside of school. And they told Jenna that their generation has no anti-Semitism. Well, I heard that and I thought, they are either very naive or very much in denial. Because I know that there's a great deal of anti-Semitism in Germany today. A lot of it is expressed as um, anti-Israel, anti-Zionism. You know, they call us, you know, they call the poor Palestinians that we're oppressing the victims of the victims. And when they come here, you know, they stay in the, you know, they, a lot of Germans come here. And if they come for some time, I was many years ago uh, taking Ulpan at Hebrew University some 30 some years ago. And there were two German students in the Ulpan. They were staying in the Arab part of town. Clearly their sympathies were with the poor oppressed Arabs because the Jews were like oppressing them. So this is of course just a, a respectable, politically correct uh, cover for anti-Semitism. but I know there's more anti-Semitism. I've talked to people who have spent time in Germany, Jews who had, did not have a Jewish name or a Jewish appearance, 
And so they passed as non-Jews and they heard a lot of talk about that. And, um, and I knew that it's not true that there's, that there's no anti-Semitism in Germany today. There's a great deal of anti-Semitism in Germany today. So I, um, I didn't know how to respond to what Jenna's disclosure about these girls crying and crying because of what I had said in my talk. It certainly doesn't feel good to be hated. And um, I mean, even if you killed six million Jews and innumerable gypsies and gays and communists and other people, you know, well, I like to want to be hated. It was not our generation. Da 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 da. Okay, I know all the excuses. So, but so Jenna left, but I didn't feel. I told her to tell the girls that you know that that um that they're either naive or in denial because there is anti-Semitism in Germany and maybe they need to look at it. I didn't feel good about it. I didn't feel good about knowing about Jenna's visit, disclosing to me that there had been two Jewish uh, women in the, my audience the previous night. And I even called my mentor to ask her and I told her the whole story and she said, you didn't do anything wrong. Nothing, you, do, you didn't do anything wrong. Again, disclosing, I tell my book how, you know, this was the first thing that clued me in that I might be a, 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 a reincarnation from a Holocaust soul is that I was born with this like seething hatred of everything German. I was born with it. So um, I didn't feel good about it. And the next morning I did Hispotidus. I do Hispotidus every morning. That means talking to God in my own words, in my own language, which is English. And, uh, and talking out loud to God. And that's something that I do and I recommend it for everybody to do, talk to God. So I was talking to God and when I talk to God, I also listen. And I realized what was wrong, why I didn't feel at ease. Because one of my, my probably the, my favorite teaching my whole life is the teaching of Rav Shlomo Walba that there are two distinct worlds or spiritual dimensions. One is the world of connection, the Olam HaYedidut, and one is the world of estrangement, the Olam HaZarut. And at any moment of our lives, we are in one of those two worlds. And we choose which world we're going to be in. And we can say, so-and-so made me angry, so therefore I'm disconnected. But in the end, we choose which world we want to be in. And the Olam HaYedidut is a world of happiness and faith and trust and love and joy and feel and self-esteem and, and having courage to do what you have to do. It's a great world. And the other world, the world of estrangement, it's a dark world of anger and criticism and hatred and jealousy and depression and worry, all the all the dark things. And we're in whatever world we choose to be in by our actions. When, we're, when we are critical, we put ourselves into the world of estrangement. So I thought about that. As you know, I wrote, you may not know, I wrote a biography of Revison Hyasar Kramer called Holy Woman. That was my first best-selling book. And she was a survivor of Auschwitz. She was taken to Auschwitz, Auschwitz at the age of, uh, she had just turned 20. Her parents, her older sisters, nieces and nephews, everyone was killed the first night they were in Auschwitz. One sister survived to be made to work, and they, she was killed right in front of her, a gunshot to the head, because she dropped a stone when they were building a waterfall for the Nazi officer's garden. And, um, and she was experimented on by Dr. Mengele. And she, you know, by the time she was, by the time the Russians liberated Auschwitz, in January of 1945, she had not a single living relative. So I once asked, she came to Israel, amazing story. She was always happy, happy and loving all the time. Although very poor, no children. She was married to the great Sadiq Rav Yaakov Moshe Kramer. But, you know, I, in the book, I explore how the person who had a background she had and who had so little in this lifetime in the present could be so happy. That's another subject, but um, she. But she was. She was happy and loving all the time. And I asked her once, "Do you hate Germans?" And she said, "Kein, I'm so not so tough, so not so tough." 
Yes, yes, I hate them. She said it without any emotional charge, as if she was saying, you know, yes, I I hate broccoli. <laughs> you know, something like that. Like, like I hate uh, lima beans. Like no emotional charge. And I realized that given her experience, her official position was that she hates Germans, but there's no place for hatred in her heart because she lives in the world of connection. She lives in that world of love and happiness and, and affirmation and faith in God. And there was no room for hatred in her heart. I experienced this when I asked her, do you hate Germans? So I thought about it. And I thought, you know, I might be an all Jews, both those who have been directly impacted by the Holocaust, because we know that children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors are also scarred. There's been a lot of studies that show children of Holocaust survivors for sure, and even grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. I know grandchildren of Holocaust survivors who are scarred by the Holocaust. So it's like, really the truth is, oh, all Jewish people suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder from the Holocaust. So do we have a right to hate Germans from that time, of course, from this time, if they're still anti-Semitic? I believe we do. But, and here's the big but, and I hope nobody <laughs> just turns off this recording before they listen to my, to my lesson that I learned from this. When we have hatred in our heart, it puts us into the olam hazarut, the world of disconnection. And how do we get out of the world of disconnection? It's very simple. Any act of giving will take us to the world of connection. That's the secret. I should give a whole class on that, and I probably will sometime. So I thought, what can I give to these girls? And I decided to send a WhatsApp to Jenna, to ask her to tell, to suggest to the girls that they buy a book called I, S I Slept in Hitler's Room by Tuvia Tenenbaum. Now Tuvia Tenenbaum was born actually in Israel to uh, Germ in a German speaking home to parents who survived the Holocaust. And uh, he speaks fluent German. He, he went to America. He founded, uh, he lived, lived in America for like 30 years, founded the Jewish theater or something in New York. And he, he got his, his degrees in fine arts and science and all kinds of things. And, he, his, and he's a journalist in addition to many other things. And he was, because he's fluent in German, he was writing for the uh, German paper, Die Zeit. And, uh, and at some point, one of the major publishers in Germany asked him to write a book. To come to Germany, as an American, and write a book about his first impressions. So he did. And, uh, and he's, he's very funny. So he, like a lot of tongue in cheek. And like he, he met political figures and prostitutes or drug addicts or, you know, or the, the Muslims, Jews, Christians, nuns, you know, all kinds of people. That, people in right-wing demonstrations, people in left-wing demonstrations, and he would just talk to them and he'd record their conversations. He got permission to, uh, he had witness for every conversation and got permission to, to, to quote them verbatim. And so when he quotes and quotes, it's verbatim. And from major political figures, he agreed to, you know, send them what he was going to quote uh, before it was published. Okay, so he wrote the book, I Slept in Hitler's Room. And the book, has a lot, the book has a lot about many, many things, but it also has a lot of exposure of anti-Semitism. And uh, the publisher, when the book was all written, the one in charge of the publishing house said, he cannot publish this book. It's, it's like, da, 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 da. and he needs, certain things need to be taken out. And what are the things that he took out? every single mention of anti-Semitism. And Tobia Tenenbaum said, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to, you can't publish a book like this. You're censoring my book. And I want to just uh, read you something from this, uh, from this book by Tobia Tenenbaum, because again, I want to emphasize 
he went there with a positive feeling toward Germany. He liked German culture. He liked, you know, spoke German. He says, and this is in his in, in the introduction to the book, and he was struggling and fighting with them about, about publishing everything he had written, because it was true. And he says, this is a country that has not changed since Hitler's days in power. No, of course, Hitler does not rule Germany today. The Nazi party is outlawed and Germany no longer exterminates Jews or gays. But Hitler, let us not forget, did not create the Holocaust. He simply operated in a social environment that invited it. The people were ready. Hitler, an Austrian nobody, stirred the pot of hate that had preceded him in his unsold paintings. The people's hearts were with him as they are today. The hate for the Jew then and the hate for the Jew today, as described in this book, is the same exact hate. Yes, I know it's a horrible thing to say, to accuse a whole nation of racism, but as horrible as it is to say this of people, it's manifold more horrible to find out that this is the truth. I wish from the bottom of my heart that it were not the case that the people of Germany, people I've always liked, were not what I found them to be. Okay, so what I did was I sent Jenna a WhatsApp suggesting that she suggest to these two German women who said that there's no anti-Semitism in their generation, that they read this book. In the end, he could, he could not get it published in Germany. And he published it in America, in English. He wrote it in German published it in English under the name uh, I Slept in Hitler's Room by Tullia Tenenbaum. So I sent uh, Jenna the name of the book and the author and suggested that they do some research, that they investigate, that they, if they really feel bad about how Jews, or this particular one Jew, feels toward Germany, that they should do some investigation and research what is really the truth about uh, German anti-Semitism today. And after I sent that email, I felt at peace. I felt I was giving them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they really don't know. Maybe you know, their friends don't talk about it. Maybe they really don't realize that all the anti-Israel sentiment among, sentiment among young Germans is really an anti-Semitism. Maybe they really don't know. So I'm, like, I reached out to them. I'm, I, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt, that their heart's in the right place, and that when they read this book, they will be edified. So that's the lesson. The lesson is that hatred, even when it is justified, destroys the person who entertains it in their heart. And that's true if it's on a, a personal level, in terms of people in the family, people who have, have mistreated you, people have, who have uh, betrayed you. People have dipped you out of the inheritance. We all, there's all kinds of reasons to hate people. And of course, hating people politically or hating neighbors who act wrongly. People act wrongly. And sometimes hatred is justified. But the lesson that I learned is even if it's justified, it destroy, hatred destroys the person who keeps it in their heart. It's like, it's like a cancer inside one's body and it eats up the person in the cells. So how do we get out of the world of estrangement? We get out of that world by any act of giving. And I, so I did that act of giving and then I felt at peace that I, that I gave to those two girls who, who are, I gave them the benefit of the doubt. They may not, might really honestly not realize the, the anti-Semitism problem in Germany today. So I invite you to, that's my story and my lesson. I invite you to add a comment down here below if you disagree with me, um, always happy to hear disagreement, but as long as it's backed up. I don't just say I disagree, but tell me why and, and, and your train of thought on the subject. And with that, greetings from the old city of Jerusalem. <laughs>